thanks very much, Bruce. Um, I wish I could say that that was just around the corner, um, but I, I think we are m making steps in that direction, but we're not quite at growing cars right out of the ground. Um, but I'm very excited to, to be here today to tell you a little bit about um, the work in my lab that involves both renewable materials and renewable chemistries that come from plants. Um, and two, two areas I'm going to discuss are metabolic pathway discovery and engineering. And in this context, we're interested in small molecules, both for human and for plant health. And the other area I'm, I want to talk about is using plant biomass directly to make bio-based and renewable materials. So specific stories I want to, to tell you about um, have to do, again, with small molecules and large molecules from plants. So small molecules here um, uh, are represented by this compound called etoposide. So this is a clinically used anti-cancer agent that's derived from a plant molecule. So the gray part is um, the synthetic part, and the rest all comes from plant chemistry. Um, and of course, again, this is a compound that's very important for human health. Now down here on the bottom, I have a molecule that looks very different. This is a model of lignin, which is a polymer, um, a major component of plant biomass. This polymer is used by plants for structural support and protection, um, and we're trying to find, figure out new ways uh, to use it uh, for materials. So these two things, this small molecule up here for human health um, uh, pharmaceutical and this biopolymer that comes from plants might seem very distantly related. So, so why am I telling you these, these two very different stories? It turns out that they're not so different to the plant, right? So plants are, are very uh, ingenious in using their metabolism in, in all different kinds of ways. So it turns out that this molecule and this biopolymer are actually come from the same roots of metabolism. So you can trace back this blue part to these phenylpropanoids, which are derived just from primary metabolism and the molecule phenylalanine. So this is, a, a, I think, a, a great example of how plants use something that they have to have to make proteins, and they can make compounds important for their own health and turns out for human health, and biopolymers that we use to make materials. So within these, uh, these two niches of metabolism, there's different kinds of engineering questions. So the first, um, when it comes to small molecules, relates to how can we build these pathways? What are the components necessary to perform metabolic engineering so that we can copy the chemistry that's found in nature and possibly make new and more active derivatives? Now down on the bottom, in the context of lignin, plants actually are, are really great at making tons of lignin. I'll tell you in a little bit, it's the second most abundant biopolymer on Earth. And so we, I, arguably, sometimes we would like to make actually less of it. Um, so there's plenty of it around. And so the question here is more, how can we use it rather than can we make more? So I'm going to start with this, this bottom story of how can we use lignin to make renewable materials. And our efforts in this area are really part um, of a collaborative team on campus here. We affectionately call ourselves the, the green team. So these are a group of faculty, students and postdocs as well, I don't have all their pictures shown, who are interested in generating renewable materials. And so this is not a comprehensive uh, listing of everyone involved. But some of the work I'll talk about today involves Sarah Billington, who's a structural engineer, Craig Criddle, an environmental engineer, Kurt and myself, um, both from chemical engineering, and Bob Weymouth um, from chemistry. And again, our vision is to be able to use monomers um, derived from nature that are renewable, assemble them into polymers, and then fabricate materials that are indeed renewable. And so we're, we're not just uh, involved in this front part of the process, but we're also very interested in ensuring that this is a sustainable material cycle, that the materials we make not only are high performance, but can be reused through end of life disassembly and reassembly. This kind of cycle um, all relates to finding a way to, to shortcut a much longer petroleum-based carbon cycle. Right? Of course, this is a renewable process. It just takes a really, really long time. And so where we're focusing our efforts are on shorter cycles that come from biomass to make renewable materials. Now, as I mentioned, one of the biopolymers that we're, we've been focusing on is lignin. And 
Many of you might be familiar with lignin, but to give you a little background, what is lignin and why do we care about it? This is a sandwich structure of a plant cell wall here. Um, and there's actually quite a few biopolymers that are part of the plant cell wall. One of them shown in orange here is cellulose. So this is what's really exciting about second generation biofuels. These cellulose fibrils are the polysaccharides which, which, with which we're trying to extract sugars to generate liquid biofuels. But as you can see, these cellulose fibrils are, are tied up in a mat of other biopolymers, including lignin. So in this context, lignin can be a nuisance because you need to get rid of it to get at cellulose. So as part of biofuels processing streams, um, where cellulose is coming out at one end to get fermentable sugars, there's also a large fraction of lignin that's very low value um, that's generated. So to take a closer look um, and compare cellulose and lignin. Again, cellulose is a polysaccharide, so we, we try to get out these monomers so that we can put them to work with microbes to generate liquid biofuels. Lignin looks very different. Um, and what really attracted me to lignin was the fact that it's one of the only sources in nature where you can get these um, uh, aromatic, all carbon-based units. And so I thought that this is currently a very low value material, but perhaps we could work with it to and apply some chemistry to make it into something more valuable. And again, cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer on Earth, but lignin is just the runner up. So there's an order of billion tons biosynthesized annually. So in thinking about this problem in my lab, um, we, we've been approaching it in two different ways. And this is kind of a busy slide, but, but let me walk you through. So again, this is just a model of what lignin looks like from plants. One approach to using lignin would be to actually break it down and try to capture some of these valuable aromatics out of lignin. You could see very quickly, you start to, to get towards compounds that look like BTX-like chemicals. So this indeed could be a renewable source of platform chemicals. However, this is a difficult thing to do. Even in nature, it's hard to break down lignin, um, and to do it in a selective way is quite a challenge. So a second approach that we've taken in parallel is rather than break down lignin, let's use it as it is. Let's use it and see if we can generate novel materials and biocomposites from it. However, it turns out that lignin really functions best when it's part of that fabric in the plant cell wall. So by itself, it doesn't make a great material. So what we've tried to do is combine lignin with other renewable polymers sourced from nature to make novel composites. And simply mixing them together, as I'll tell you, also is not ideal. So surface modification of the lignin and actual physical cross-linking of lignin with other biopolymers is what we've turned to to generate lignin building blocks with tunable properties. So, you, you probably can tell I like to think in terms of molecular structures. So on this slide, I just I, I like to take a step back and think about what's available from nature in terms of biopolymers. There's quite a bit of diversity, but there still are some limits to it. So there's kind of a repertoire of biopolymers. Some you may have heard, some you may not have. Of course, DNA is, is, a, is a very widely known biopolymer. Polysaccharides, this is an example of chitin biopolymers. But there's also some nice polyesters um, and even hydrocarbons, rubber polyisoprenes. So what we wanted to do was take lignin and see if we could combine it with one of these other uh, renewable biopolymers to make um, a composite that was high performing. And so what we thought is we have hydroxyl groups here on lignin, perhaps we can find a way to chemically link it to a polyester. So I've shown here polyhydroxybutyrate, but another uh, renewable polymer that you can get from natural materials is polylactic acid, and that's the one that we focused on. So I also want to mention that um, lignin comes in many different forms. Um, depending on how you get lignin out of the plant, if you're trying to make paper, you might use a certain process that, that ends up giving you lignin with um, certain chemical functionality. If you're trying to extract sugars to make biofuels, you might get another kind of lignin. So the one that we focused on is this indolin AT lignin, which comes from the paper and pulp industry. But ultimately, our goal is to use lignin that comes from biofuels processing streams, since we anticipate with second generation biofuels, a lot of this will be available. Okay, so again, the challenge here is to take lignin and see if we can combine it with some of these polyesters to make a renewable material. And I'm gonna um, make a long story short by just 
showing you the, the, the final results here that came through that collaboration with multiple faculty in chemistry, structural engineering, and chemical engineering. What we ended up doing was taking lignin and actually graft polymerization of lactide to generate a lignin polylactic acid copolymer. So we were able to show using a variety of spectroscopic techniques that we had a covalent linkage here between the polyester and lignin. And the way we did this was to use a green process. So Bob Weymouth in chemistry had some very nice catalysis that we could apply to make these kinds of renewable copolymers. These copolymers turn out to blend very nicely with polylactic acid to generate biocomposites. So just to give you a sense of the importance of actually linking lignin covalently to the polyester, this is what happens. So here's polylactic acid by itself. You actually can't see it, it's translucent. Um, uh, and it's, polylactic acid is an important material for making things like biodegradable cups and, and renewable um, food containers. Um, so if you mix polylactic acid directly with lignin, you see that you, you get a composite, but it's, it's not, um, the lignin is not well dispersed within the polylactic acid matrix. However, if you mix polylactic acid with our covalently modified lignin, we now get a, a much improved dispersion um, in these PLA composites. And so you don't have to just look by eye um, to see that there's, the blending is much better here. The UV and optical properties change as well. So this is just a profile showing UV transmittance. This is actually a problem with polylactic acid plastics that are used um, in that, that there's quite a bit of optical transmittance at higher wavelengths. But you can see when you compare this green line here to the red line, when we use our copolymer, we get very nice absorption on par with what you observe with polytrithalic acid compared to the red line, which is just mixing of PLA and lignin together. So mechanical properties are also um, withheld here as well. These green bars, these are just uh, different mechanical tests performed by my colleague Sarah Billington and her students to show that when, once you start adding this copolymer um, of lignin PLA to a PLA matrix, you uh, retain um, the strength of the material. So one drawback here, though, is that we're taking lignin, we're covalently modifying it with PLA, and then we're mixing it with PLA. So the, the total amount of lignin in these materials is not very high. So another approach that we've tried to take here is to, to make the material, uh, the, the a much higher percentage of the material lignin. So this would be a much better use um, of our lignin source. And through chemical modification, we thought we might be able to generate a renewable-based adhesive. Right? So what we've done here, again, I won't show you the details of the chemistry, but we've been able to take lignin and use a renewable bio-based crosslinker to generate, um, again, a covalently mod modified lignin, which now has adhesive properties. So you can see these are some sandwich boards made um, in the Bill Billington lab. Um, and we envision that this kind of copolymer could be very useful as a renewable adhesive. So again, just illustrating some of the mechanical properties of this bio-based adhesive. Um, this is done with a three-point bending test um, to show that lignin adhesives actually retain um, very good strength um, in this context compared to other bio-based adhesives on the market. So to take a step back, I think we've done some nice work with lignin, and we think that there's a lot more to do here. But in general, again, we're really interested in, in renewable materials. And one thing that we're constantly up against is that some of the polymers in nature don't have the kinds of properties that we might want for a plastic or a packaging material. Um, and so where do we go? If this is our repertoire of biopolymers, what, what can we do from here? So one thing that we've, we've started thinking about is that even though this is the repertoire of biopolymers found in nature, there's a much larger repertoire of monomers that are renewable found in nature. And so we could use these monomers and then apply either a chemical or an enzymatic polymerization process to make a non-natural polymer that perhaps has um, materials properties that are more desirable. So I think this is kind of what's on the horizon for us in terms of um, green team efforts. 
So in order, to, in order to obtain some of these monomers, a lot of what's required is metabolic engineering of pathways in nature. So I want to um, take the, the, just the, the last few minutes here and tell you a little bit about how we think about building metabolic pathways. Um, and in that context, I'm going to turn back to this molecule that I told you is very important for human health, atopicide. Um, this is currently prepared semi-synthetically. So the, the, the part in black here is isolated from the plant, and then chemistry is used to build on um, this functionality at the oxygen. Um, so we would like to know how does nature make this molecule, and can we engineer that pathway so that we can make other derivatives of this compound with improved properties such as solubility and activity. So again, these are small molecules coming from plants. The one that I'm going to highlight here um, is a clinically used drug. But this kind of process could be used for making any kind of molecule that could potentially come from plants, something important for nutrition, biofuels, materials, and fine chemicals. So what do we need? What do we need from plants to get um, to the chemistry that's involved in making these molecules? Really, the key is the blueprint, so the biosynthetic genes that encode the enzyme catalysts that make these molecules. And since 2000, when the first plant was sequenced, we now have about 100 plants um, who have, we have some genetic information about their genome sequence. So just with these letters on a page, we can start building pathways to make these small molecules. So turning back to that compound I told you about, um, atopicide. Um, this is our test case here. We would like to be able to metabolically engineer this pathway. And as I told you, it starts out from a molecule that's pretty simple. It's actually the, the precursor both to um, this molecule as well as lignin. Um, but the entire biosynthetic pathway is not known. So there's a, a fraction of it that we understand well. So I'm just summarizing here, which is sort of the, the bottom left portion. We know the genes and the biosynthetic enzymes that are involved in making this advanced stage intermediate. But there's a big portion that we don't know. So it's really impossible for us to actually go and metabolically engineer the entire pathway at the moment. So this is the challenge that my lab took. We wanted to take gene information that we had from the producing plant. We don't want to work in the producing plant. We want to be able to metabolically engineer the entire pathway. And so we had, again, a part that was known and a part where discovery was required. So how do we go about discovering um, pieces of a pathway and components of a pathway that are not known? So like I said, we don't want to have to work in, in the actual plant. We'd like to be able to take these biosynthetic genes and move them to some other host where it's much easier to observe activity. And it turns out that an easy host for us to use is the tobacco plant in lab. So we can take biosynthetic genes, one, two, three, four, any number of them, and within just a matter of days, we can put them into the leaf of this plant and we can start installing a pathway. We then use mass spectrometry to observe new compounds that, that are produced. So in this way, we can combinatorially start building a pathway and discovering new pieces. So again, our first, um, going back one slide, our first objective here was to build the known part of the pathway, and then we wanted to discover the back part. So I'll just tell you where we're at in that process um, and show you a little bit of data. Okay, so I'll just close by um, acknowledging my research group. I have five graduate students who are working on these projects, um, uh, as well as several undergraduates and a postdoc. Um, I mentioned our collaboration on the renewable materials efforts, um, as well as these are some funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Yes. Sorry, the... Thank you. Can you comment anything about the phase diagrams of these biopolymeric systems? The phase diagrams? Yeah, so like you mentioned, like, okay, um, for storage, um, we know that we use binary colloids to develop um, new systems, and so there's a phase diagram of um, normal uh, polymers or regular polymers. So I was wondering, if, is there a specific phase diagram for biopolymers? And can you comment anything on 
um, how does that look different from um, regular polymers? So, um, not really, actually. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the question. In terms of, of the material itself compared to um, other polymers found in nature or other man-made polymers? Other, other man-made polymers. Well, I, I think I showed the, the properties that I'm most familiar with are the ones that we've measured for the lignin PLA copolymer, and that was the optical properties um, and then the mechanical properties. So uh, beyond that, I guess I don't, I don't have any other information. But again, you know, one of the nice things about working on this project is my um, expertise is really in the area of plant chemistry, whereas uh, I rely on the Billington Lab for mechanical engineering expertise, um, and Kurt for polymer chemistry. Kurt, do you have any comments that you, you could add on that? No. Okay. <laughs> so, um, sorry. Yes. Teresa Wegesser from Chevron. Um, out of curiosity, why did you pick the tobacco plant as your model or your host? Yeah, um, so tobacco works, the, the method for actually expressing these biosynthetic genes in tobacco is not ours, that was established in the literature. Um, tobacco works really well. What we have to do, and I, I skipped over this, but to get a gene into a leaf, we actually have to infiltrate this bacterial suspension. Tobacco has really nice big leaves. Um, it also has a reasonably short life cycle. Um, so it's been a nice model plant to use in the lab. Sorry, once you've put the gene into the leaf, mm -hmm. can you pollinate it and all its children have got the same ability? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the, the approach that we're using that I really like is that this is transient expression. We're not generating um, uh, transient or, or transgenic lines of plants. So we're only um, introducing DNA into the leaf, not into the seed. So it's its progeny will not carry these biosynthetic genes. And that's why we can do it so fast. Um, you know, it only takes a few days to see results. Okay, maybe we should move on to yeah. uh, the next talk. Thank you very much for your talk.